the these, I guess, refers to chapters 1 through 20, right? What is in John? <clears throat> these have been written so that. So here's what, we, what is called a purpose clause. Here's the reason these have been written. You follow me? So if you want to know why is the gospel of John in the Bible, this is the answer right here. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, by, by, and that believing you may have life in his name. So why does John write the Gospel of John? For what? Evidence for salvation. For belief. For conversion. He writes so that people would see these signs and miracles and believe. Now he gets specific. <clears throat> he talks about which Jesus he wants them to believe in. He says that they would believe that Jesus is, number one, the Christ. So it's not just that he wants people to believe about Jesus. Jehovah's Witness believe about Jesus. Mormons believe about Jesus. You and I believe about Jesus. But we're, we all three believe differently about Jesus. So John says, I want you to believe that he's the Christ, the anointed one, the one sent by God. <clears throat> believe that he is the Christ. Here's, here is a man who came and he is king. Not only that he's the Christ, but number two, that he's the son of God. Now if he's the son of God, what does that make him? God. God. So the Christ is his humanity. God is his deity. So John, John says a mouthful in about three words. The Gospel of John is written that I would know and believe that Jesus is the man who is the Christ and that he's the, he is God in the flesh. He's the Son of God. <clears throat> and then he says, here is an effect. I believe this and then something happens. And what is it that happens? That you have life. life. And I am given life. The implication is, I don't have life. If I'm given life, it means I didn't have it. So right here, there's such a beautiful, concise, hard picture of the gospel and what is necessary to believe about Jesus. So I need to believe that Jesus is a man come to, me, come to the world who is king. He is God in the flesh, and he gives life to dead people or life to those who don't have life. That's why you have the Gospel of John. That's why so many times the Gospel of John is recommended to unbelievers. Read the Gospel of John and, 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 and watch God speak to you. So John writes this book so that you would believe. So it sounds like his readership would be believers or non-believers? Non -believers. Mostly non-believers. Can, can we believers benefit from it? Oh, certainly. Because it reminds us of what he's done. But the, but the intended readership is non-believers, okay? Go to 1 John. And what I want to do is do the same thing. If you can keep your finger in John 20 and come to 1 John, do that. Because it's, it's, it's much easier to see if we can see them side by side. <clears throat> Let me get my reader. Let's okay. So in John 20, the pattern was, but these have been written. Verse 31 says, but these have been written. Okay? Chapter 5, verse 13 of 1 John. But these things I have written to you. Can you hear already kind of a similarity there? 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. 
Do you hear the similarities of those two, of John 20 and 1 John 5? <clears throat> What's different? No, you to the Lord first. How do you know? The Lord. Wait, so it's it. written to who believe. I've written to you who believe. So it's clear that John's gospel is to those who haven't believed. He, he's seeking conversion there. And here, <clears throat> John is writing to people who do believe. And according to verse 13... What does it appear is the reason he writes to people who do believe? That they may know that they have eternal life. What did you say? So that they know that they have eternal life. Okay. So I'm going to go, we're going to go out of order. John has about four or five of these. I have written this in the gospel, in the first, in the, in first John. So John, there's, there's, there's about four reasons why John writes 1 John. One of those reasons, what did y'all say it, according to this verse? Believers. It's for the child of God and what does he want the child of God to know or have? Assurance. Assurance. For the child of God to have assurance. And so we could put the word security. Everybody see where we got that? Okay. <clears throat> Go to chapter 2, verse 26. Two twenty six says, These things I have written to you, you see our pattern again? It's the same language. These things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. So according to this verse, why does he write 1 John? He writes it to the believer. For what? To warn them about things that will lead them astray. And if I'm warning you about things that will lead you astray, why am I, what's my reason for warning you about that? So you won't go astray. So you won't. So I, he writes it for the child of God to be protected from what, do you think? All stuff. I'm going to expand on that. False teachers, false doctrine. Everybody follow me so far? So if this was security, then there is a safety. He writes this for their own safety. Okay, um, there's another one, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if, you want, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So, 2, 1, he writes... This one's a little more difficult to, to tease out, but it's still there. Why does he? What's what's the reason for the for for, for First John according to two one? Purity. Okay, purity. Reconciliation to the Father. Okay, reconciliation to the Father. If I have, have been saved from my sins, I've been redeemed, I have been converted, is that the end of my salvation? No. No. Now I have sanctification to walk through. Now I have a life.
life where I, I've got to learn how to live without sinning. And so I, I here, I think he is reminding us that uh, he writes this so the child of God would be prevented from sinning. And that is known as sanctification. He writes to give us assurance. He writes to protect us from false teachers. He writes to prevent us from sinning. One more. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 4. He says, These things we write. There's our these things again. So that our joy may be made complete. So he writes, why? The child of God child of God may be filled with true joy and that is satisfaction. So these are the reasons it appears that John writes. And so here, here's what I would encourage. It's not a real clean line as we read the text, but here's what I would encourage is is maybe start a sheet of paper that would that would have these as column headings and whenever you read a a section of first John ask yourself which of these is he talking about or you could just take these words sanctification satisfaction security safety and then just put them over headings in the text. Uh, because if this is the reason why he writes it, then guess what? The content is going to have to fall in these categories. So I, I think these are real good categories to help me kind of understand the book as a whole. The questions about that, do you see where we've got this? All we, try, all we try to do is listen to John say, hey, I wrote this for, for, for this reason. <clears throat> if this is written to non-believers, John 20, 1 John's written primarily to believers. Um, I would be probably wise with new converts that I'm engaged with First John has a role in that discipleship process. Because this is, this is John, not to say that other books aren't, but, but I'm saying John specifically says, hey, this is, I'm writing to believers, and I'm writing that you'll, that you'll know these things. That's another, another um, key component to the gospel. To the, I mean, you can hear me say gospel. I mean First John. Is this word is is littered throughout it. But you know. Gospel of John said, I write so that you'll believe. And now he's saying, I want you to know what you believe and know that you know that you believe it. <clears throat> now, let's, let's, let's get perspective again. Okay? Um... How many New Testament books? 27. 22 of them. 22 of the New Testament books were written. And these are, there's going to be some, some 
debate on some of this, but this is just a broad brush stroke. 22 of the New Testament books were written between the years 49 and 69. 22 were written between 49 and 69. Um, it's beginning with Galatians, concluding with Jude there. Ish. Hebrews, Jude, roughly about the same time. If I do my math right, there's five left. All of John's writings, the Gospel of John, one, two, three, John, and Revelation were written in the 80s and 90s. All five. To give a couple more data points, and then I, I want to I want you to talk back to me and just what you see with these numbers, okay? John's gospel is written almost a decade after the last book of the Bible had been written. So, depending on where you put these in these 80s, 90s, it's at least 10, 11 years between John and Jude. So John is very possibly one of the last, he's, he's the last apostle actually living. Uh, but all of these are written last. And they are, there was a span of 10 years. So think of, think of this for a second. For 20 years, you're getting, you're, you're hearing new letters being written from Paul or Peter or James. And then, and then it stops. And so for another decade, there's just, there's just silence. And, and then, then you have these. Think of this also. These five books, this, this, is, this is highly profound, so follow me. These five books follow the year 70. Potentially, all the 20, all 20, 22 of the New Testament books were completed before the temple. You have five that were not. And they're after. Now keep that in mind. When you, and I would encourage you, if you've got a block of time, sit down, John chapter 1, and go to the end of Revelation. And read. And read it from the perspective of a believer post-70. And how does the message of John just resonate in a kind of fresh way. Um, Non-believers, almost individual believers here, and Revelation's written to who? The church. The church. Look at the heart of John. The lost, one-on-one, -on -one, and the church at large. I think it's a beautiful picture of, of balance in ministry, and and this is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, what do you see? Any other observations just on on kind of the dating of of this book? <clears throat> Persecution would have been higher after 69, and therefore there would have been 11 years or so, um, a, a decade, where persecution was just rampant. And so the church 
would have been really skeptical or even scattered maybe in some sense. John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation come along as encouragement. Yes. Hey, this is going to happen. <clears throat> this is going to happen too. So. Is there any... Is it a stretch to look at the Old Testament and, and between the Testament periods, old and new, that silence of God, and now you've got ten... I think there's a hint of that, yeah. I think there's a hint. And so when John is written, just the joy of being able to, number one, hear from right. the last apostle, but also this new message well, from God. if Jude is indeed the last book, you know, if it's the last one written before, before these five, what's the message of Jude? Contend for the faith, he says. You know, beware of, of false prophets and teachers and such. And so that's the final word. And then you have just a, an onslaught against Christianity for, from, from her government for, um, for years. And, and then you, then you have, have these books. Um, I, I just want you to feel all the word of God has value. And it's valuable in unique ways. But I want you to feel the weight of, I think sometimes we forget to put the books where they are. And therefore we lose some of the, I think some of the significant value that's, that's just innate. Like, like this right here, I look at this and it's in this to my soul without even cracking open the book yet. To know, one, my God knows all these things. My, my God knows this. And, and look at the books that he, that he, that he closes out. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by John, by his balance. He's not just simply devoted to lost people, but he loves the person who believes his gospel and he helps them walk in this new life. And then he says to the church, amen, because some of these churches have been around a long time, 40 years. If you look at Jude with its message. And then after 70, John starts in. It's like he's trying to capture the ones that's lost, but also for all the ones that are so-called true believers, making sure that they do have assurance from listening to false teachers, right. that, uh, doing all that into the church age to bring the church. Yeah. And I, I think after 70, I mean, there's certain points in... in in human history, as well as in our own personal history, where you're just more vulnerable and, re and uh, uh, ready to receive, and and I think there was a, you know, you're just a, you're just a decade after this ish, and um, hearts 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 stay tender, you know. Tomorrow's nine eleven, you know. We we're along. It doesn't seem like as long as it's been, because I remember it. But there was, there, there was a few years there. We were, it was still raw. And so I think that when, when the Gospel of John comes and, and he writes from Ephesus, and um, anyway, I, just, there's, I, I want you to just uh, appreciate its, its placement and its timing. Um, because that helps me understand when John opens up the, God, opens up the, the epistle, it helps me understand why he says what he said at the beginning. Okay. But you know, if he would have, I mean, he had to start with the gospel because starting with the gospel helps assure all of these because you've just recently been reintroduced, if you would, to right. who Christ is. And so that love is, is you know, revived, so to speak. And you're just re reminded of who it is that we right. serve. And then you get all of these and you say, all right, if he can do that, he can do this. So when does he go? When does he go into exile? Sure. <laughs> About then. I just had, well, I just had another. I just had another thought. You know, he has been. Um, uh, I, I would he's say been, he's, been, he's been doing ministry. He's been doing ministry and everything like that. This may be a time of encouragement to him as well, because. Um, I think legend tells us that they, they tried to 
bowl him in oil and all kinds of different things, and he didn't die. So I'm sure he's probably be, you know, all my all my other uh, brethren that I have served with are all dead and gone. Right. God, what's your purpose for me? Why am I here? Mm -hmm. And receiving this revelation, this re revelation through the Holy Spirit uh, from God, maybe is even speaking to his own soul oh, to incur to encourage you. No doubt. Because it's going, to, it's going to be in the mid to late this when Revelation is written. And, and he knows he's the last one. Now he's on a rock island. And so I, I think indeed he, he needs that encouragement. And, um, but then we find him in chapter 1. It's, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He's worshiping. Right. He's, he's worshiping on Sunday. And so, what, what a testimony just to his own discipline. <laughs> to I mean, keep by himself. In no accountability. In a situation where... Where we would look and up. say, you know what? Go, if you're pat on that rock, you've got every reason to a pat. You know, we would, we, we would fault him, not fault him for that. Exactly. I've patted at church because most people didn't show up. You know what I mean? <laughs> a lot less reasons. A whole, a whole, a whole lot less. <laughs> but to, to your point, I think, I think that... And see, isn't that the beauty of the word? We read Revelation. There's some troubling things in it, but there's some hopeful, exciting things for the church, and it encourages us. And, and even though God was giving that to John to give for future generations, it, it was for him as well. Right. Well, they're disciples. They're apostles. You know, they're, they, they, get to, they get to hang out and minister with Jesus. You know, they're, why do they need courage? Right. Right? You know, kind of. And, Jesus did and, if, and, and, exactly. and if you remember church history, remember this guy mm -hmm. was a was a disciple of John. Of John. So when John's writing this stuff, think of this, y'all. I'm he's speaking to Paul. Think of this. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, it, it's stuff like that that it. It's no more special when John was giving it to Polycarp than if you give it to me or you preach it to me. But it's still it's, it's special that here, here's a, a one of the first generation of disciples that was with the disciples. And, uh, and so when we read 1 John and 2 John and 3 John and the Gospel of John, we're reading a book that John gave. I mean, just... Just the math, I, I, I would love to have been discipled by a lot of people, but to be discipled by one of the disciples, here's a man who, not only he's written the, he's written the word of God, but he's walked with Jesus, he's, he's rested on the bosom of Jesus, and so um, uh, what, what a special relationship that was. One of the first ones to the ten. Yeah. Okay. All right, chapter one. So, do we understand? Are we all on the same page? Make sense? So I'm going to read these out loud, and what I want you to do is I want you to tell me, tell me what he said and why you think he said it, okay? What was from the beginning... What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. What's he say? What's he say a lot? What does he, what does he, what do you make of the, we've seen, we've touched, we've heard? We've experienced this is firsthand knowledge. It's not hearsay. Okay. So if I said 
I saw Clint preach. I heard him preach. I shook his hand after he preached. I had declared myself as a, as a witness, an eyewitness. And so John is saying, I touched this word of life. I uh, ate with him. The, when he's saying we, right? All right. Mm -hmm. Who's number one? Who's the we? But number two, is this the by two or three witnesses? You know, it's established. So this is further validation of. Could be. It, it, I, it could be. Not only is is this my witness, but there's there's the witness of others. So yes, I think that's that's certainly it because he's obviously. He's obviously declaring an eyewitness account. And he's saying, just like he did in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, don't believe me because I say it, but believe me because the Word also said it. So, so yes. And then secondly, who, who's the we? So who do you think the we are? Could be the disciples or the rest of them. Of the other, the other 12? Yeah. Okay. Who else? I think it's that. I think it is the other twelve. We, the, the disciples, saw him. I think that's probably a secondary we. I think there's another we in front of them. In the spirit, maybe. I don't know. And you got the spirit inspiring to write this. Yes. Believers. Okay. I think it could because, be other believers. Because that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Well, who's the we? We all, as believers, have well, heard that. Yes, I don't know if it's us yet. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I think it's, I the think there. He's saying you, some of the people reading this had also seen, heard, and touched. Yeah. And he's just calling to account. If me and Clint saw and touched Jesus, I'm saying we saw him. Even though Clint may not be one of the twelve. He's, a, he's a, a follower of Christ now. And so I think it's the 12, but I think before that, it's, it's people he's writing to to remind them, you all are his children. Because it's, it also kind of validates his message. This isn't just something that I experienced, but hey, we know 500 of you yes. saw him. Exactly. Even saw him after the, re after the resurrection. So... Uh, Makes sense. Yes, I, I, and I think it's if it's written to believers, some of the people reading this share much of John's testimony. That they could be as old as he is, or just a little bit younger, and yet became believers early in the ministry of Christ. Um, and then when you look down in 3, where it says that ye also may have fellowship with us, he's talking about all the believer stuff. Aren't you more or less newer creatures or whatever? You have fellowship with right. us. Right. Now, what does he say he has seen, heard, and touched? Or who does he say he has seen, heard, and touched? How does he refer to him? Word of life. Okay, word of life. Yeah. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. It's Jesus. And, and if we can re remember the Gospel of John, that's the first chapter, first 18 verses. In the beginning was the Word. So he refers to him as um, the Word of Life. Verse 2, he refers to the, him as the one who was with the Father who has manifested to us. So it's, it's echoes of John 1.1. 1, 1. And so we've seen him, we've touched him, we've heard him. I think this, this is a, an attack against Gnosticism because Gnosticism was a knowledge. You, you, you attain this salvation through knowledge and John is saying, uh, no, he, he is not some theory in, in, in our mind, but he is a person, he's real. Um, I think it also refers to the resurrection. I think it probably refers to resurrection more so than just simply incarnation uh, because he's saying, uh, yes, this Jesus, we all know he died, but I touched him afterwards. Uh, I ate with him afterwards. Um, 
And so he says that the reason is we, we, we proclaim to you. Now, if this is written to believers, notice, notice some of these things here. Security, safety, satisfaction, sanctification. It could be that they're struggling in these areas. So the people who are reading this are in a struggle state. They're in a, they're battling and that's why he comes back so often with this word. I want you to know this. Because right now you're kind of wobbling on it. And I want you to know it. So the readers, I would argue, are probably people that are, there's just, they just, they need some reinforcing. For whatever reason. Um, okay, the last couple books, you've got... You've got Hebrews and Jude. And in both of those books, you've got people, believers who are under attack. And they're struggling. And, and because of that, they're, they're, they're kind of wandering. And so um, I think it's important to note that, that the people reading are reading from a position of, of possible struggle. I think you can look at all them and say we struggle with some of them at different yes. times in their life. Yes. Without the persecution. And, e and, and even when I grow in each one, I've still got another layer of struggle because growth needs more growth. But yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. But even th this is even an encouragement because he's telling them, he's saying, I want you to know you are believers. And here's the thing you know, it goes back to that security. Why does he write? I write these things to you who believe. And, and it's, it's one of those of, of pushing forward, not the threat of losing what you have. You don't hear that, that thread there. Now there's some tricky passages that, just, that, that have been, you know, I, I think abused and misapplied, and we're going to wrestle with those too. But anyway. So John set the stage and he says, <clears throat> um, I've seen him, I'm an eyewitness, what I'm telling you, I have, I have experienced myself. Clear as mud. Oh, look, uh, I'm excited, yes. This... I hope this is fruitful for you, this outline. I, I feel it's, it's a good, it gives good um, categories for the book. Everything should fall under one of these in the book. <clears throat> I got so excited about the Bible that I talk about. <laughs> anyway. That's all okay. So... So here's, so here's my goal. Um, one of the things that I've learned in the last six months is everything changes every 36 hours. So I'm not going to print out a syllabus for the next 13, 14 weeks. But here's my, here's my, my plan. I want to do one lesson a week. Now, we've got more lessons, but that we can squeeze some things in. If you look on... Da, 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 da. In your notebook on the intro on the table of contents, page V, <laughs> Roman numeral five there. Do you see the scripture uh, addresses beside each lesson? That'll be we'll just follow that that guide. Okay. Um, my goal is if we get second, and third John, we'll do that. Those are only two chapters. But I really want to get First John under our belts. Um, there's more lessons than there are weeks, but we can double up on some of those, and we'll just we'll just call that the week before. So, so for example, uh, when we finish with a class tonight, I would say, hey, next week let's do the next two lessons. Uh, but right now, let's just stay at one lesson, and um, and go that route. Is that easy enough? So do you want? So you want us to be? Are we working on lesson two then? 
or are we going to stay here in in lesson one? Yeah, I've gone through much of lesson one. Okay. You can just peruse it, but I'd go quickly through it. Okay, so we do need to. Our focus should be less lesson two then. Yes, and I versus uh, chapter one verse five through two two. Yes, sir. Okay, and in your commentary, I would skim it. Because in the for, in, in your reading for lesson one in the commentary, there's like two or three ex, what they call excurses, which just are they like zero in on a particular topic and talk for three or four pages. So if you want to you know skim through that, we've talked about a lot of what's going to be in that. Uh, but for next week, we'll begin with lesson two. So we'll go verse five through chapter two, verse two. Now, if you want to, on your table of contents, let me show you where the tests will be. All right? Um, tests. Here, here's, here's my goal on tests. I'm going to give you the tests. Um, you can do open notes on that, open book on that. I, I want to I remove any tests. Angst. <laughs> okay? My goal is, is these two hours every day or once a week. Okay? Okay. Um, your first one will be, we'll cover the first six lessons. Lessons one through six. So somewhere after lesson six, I'll give you that and you can take it home. Uh, seven through 12 will be the next one. And then 13 to 17, we'll have the last one. And then we'll take a vote on whether you want to do, you want the final to be um, new material or collection of all of it. Okay? I handed you a piece of paper. So here's kind of what... So next week we got lesson two. We got chapter one, verse five through two, two, two. Here's kind of what I like to do. And, and I don't want you to stress out of it cause, uh, about it because it's been several weeks here. Um, if you've got your Greek New Testament, not here today, but uh, practice just reading the passage. Just read it out loud. Um, as best you can, just, tr just try to translate. You can use an interlinear to help you out. Um, use tools, but just begin to try to translate. I would like for you to, to be, note verbs. I've got note verbs, note the subject, and then underline prepositional phrases. Try to write out your own translation. So you, you look at it and, and, and just try you know, to, to work through that. Um, but I, I want us to use the text. Okay? Don't neglect your English text. Read your English text. All right? Bring it. But uh, because we will, we will dive into the English text, I mean, we, we use it extensively. Um, but, but I do want I I to keep our Greek at least somewhat fluid, um, uh, fresh. But here's what I would like for you to whatever passage, to write a one to two sentence summary of that passage. Okay? So next week it will be a summary on one five through two two. Okay. And what I'm looking for there is what's the main idea of that passage? What one thought is the author communicating to the readers? If you had to narrow it down to one thought of that passage, what's the main idea of that passage? Put that in one or two sentences. And I didn't stick this on. I didn't, I didn't write this on here. But if you could, if you could put the passage in one of these categories, is chapter one five through two two? Is it a passage on security? Is it a passage on sanctification? Hint, hint. That's probably since two one is in it, <laughs> um, and it's connected to. It's the end. So here's another place where chapter divisions are bad, because. Um, 2-2 two, two is the end of the little unit. So. Does that make sense? So far as the Greek, you, you want us to try to read 1-5 through 2-2 two, two in the Greek. Yeah, just you try to break it down. And, and it could be you take the, the interlinear, uh, get an interlinear and, and just put the English words under all the other words and then just note the verbs, note the subject, um, because what we will do is, is we will, we will consult, 
we will look at the, at the, at the Greek text to, to say, to kind of look at the verbs and just see, just see kind of what we, what we can see. So I, I hadn't been able to do much study like I thought I would, but in certain stuff I am using, I, I do the uh, Blue Bible. And I do the in the year. So. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just, what you know, what I would like, you know, if, if you use the interlinear, maybe just take a few minutes to to just see what you see as you as you examine some of those words. Um, uh, I want to do I want us to do some word studies through this book and such. So don't stress out about the Greek. Okay, I I just want us to I want us to kind of wade back into it, and I want to use it as we as we do the class. And I think by, by, by us dive bombing on the passage and the words, we'll, it'll, it'll kind of help refresh some things. What would help, though, is in your textbook from last year or from last semester, your Greek textbook, lesson six, chapter 16, um, is a review chapter. So I would encourage you to go back to chapter 16. That's page 107. And, and read that a couple of times just to get your mind kind of refreshed on some of the language and, and such.